How is Bitcoin doing right now? is the question you're probably gonna be asked a lot over the holidays. And most questions, they're really only referring to the price. But in this video, I'm gonna prepare you to answer that, how is Bitcoin doing right now question. I'm gonna give you the facts, the data, and the bigger picture so you can feel confident explaining this to your friends, your family during the holiday season. So stay tuned. All right, welcome back. So the holidays are here. We got Thanksgiving and then of course going right into Christmas. You're gonna be getting together with your friends, your family, and the question that you're gonna be hearing if you've been in Bitcoin and cryptocurrency for any number of years, the question you're gonna be hearing is, how's Bitcoin going for you? How's that Bitcoin thing doing? How's Bitcoin doing, right? We hear that all the time. And and I, you know, personally, I'm gonna be hearing it countless times and I'm sure you are as well. And I wanna, I wanna arm you for that. So if we kind of just go back in time a little bit, two years ago, you know, Bitcoin was booming, right? Cryptocurrencies was booming. Everybody was curious. Everybody wanted to know what was going on. And you know, you got together with your family and, and you probably had this cousin and he was bragging about how much money he was making, you know, in Ripple or whatever. And then maybe you have this brother-in-law and he works in traditional traditional finance. And he said, no, oh, no, that's stupid. It's a tulip bubble. It's a Ponzi scheme or whatever. And, and you saw that. And then of course, last year, cryptocurrency was way down. It was down about 80 to 90% off of its peak. And so that cousin who had made all that money in Ripple, he ended up selling at a massive loss and lost his money. And then your brother-in-law, he had told the whole family, I told you so. I told you so. So he was right. And that's kind of where we were last year. And this year, Maybe you're dreading going back to the family because they're all gonna ask you, how's Bitcoin doing? How's Bitcoin going? And what does that even mean, right? Well, the people that are asking this question, they, they don't really know what they're asking, right? They don't, they don't really know what it's about and, and that's probably why they're asking it like that way. And so they're not gonna understand the normal answers that we're gonna give them. So let me offer you some help uh, on how to get ready for this. So first, the first thing you have to do is you have to understand why Bitcoin is important, right? So unfortunately, we talk about going down the Bitcoin rabbit hole. And so to understand Bitcoin, you have to understand a lot of things. And so really to understand Bitcoin, you have to understand why, why Bitcoin is important. So just tell them, look, this is why Bitcoin is important. This is how it's doing. And I'm going to get to that. So stick with me here. So you have to understand why Bitcoin is important. So the world has massive problems with money, debt, privacy, and trust. All right, money and debt. The global debt is $255 trillion. That's $32,500 of debt for every single person on the planet. Imagine that. We have a massive problem with money and debt. In the US, the Fed's expanding the balance sheet faster and faster, $23, $24 trillion in debt. Right now, the Fed is injecting hundreds of billions of dollars into the banking system every single night just to keep it from crashing. That's happening right now. They've been cutting rates. First, they said, we're gonna start raising rates. Next thing you know, it wasn't going the way they wanted. They're starting to cut rates again, even while the stock market is reaching all-time highs. If the market's so good, why are they cutting rates, right? In China, it's even worse. We have 23 trillion in debt. China has over $50 trillion of debt. We're seeing banks collapsing right now today. We have negative interest rates in, in uh, all across the world when a government wants to have uh, take on debt, they issue bonds. And over half of government bonds are negative yielding. That means they're worth less than zero, $17 trillion is worth less than zero. And because of all this, we're seeing massive protests, massive protests. Now, it started about a year ago in Paris um, with the yellow vest, but now we've we've seen it going on in Hong Kong. Millions of people, two million people protests. marching down the street. It's now it's spread to Spain and Catalonia. Massive protests, million people marching in Catalonia, million people marching in Peru. Venezuela, cr countries crashing, Argentina, we've been seeing it now going on for the last month or two in Lebanon, um, Iran. So we have, you know, almost a dozen countries around the world with over a million people each protesting because of what's going on. It's, and it's growing faster and faster and faster. In Iran, the protests have gotten so big that the country of Iran shut down the internet. They shut down the internet so they wouldn't have people communicating, spreading the information. They went and burned down the banks because they know it's the money that's causing the problem. 
in Lebanon. After months of protests, the banks just shut down completely. The banks were shut down for over a month. Imagine having no access to your bank and not being able to get any money. Shut down for over a month. Then when they finally reopened, they limited withdrawals to only $1,000. So yeah, the bank's open, but you can only get out $1,000 at a time. But now they're running out of cash. And they've, they've run out of cash so much that now they're refusing to give cash out to people that have the banks. Do you get the common theme here? We're seeing this increase of the surveillance state. Of course, China's leading the way. Facial recognition, they have this thing called social credit score, where if you say the wrong thing on social media or whatever, you get your, your, your uh, credit score lowered. And if your social credit score gets lowered enough, you're not able to travel, buy bus tickets, plane tickets, et cetera. I believe there's somewhere between one to two million people in China that aren't able to travel because their social credit score is too low. Australia is starting to um, catch up really, really fast. They want to surveil everything, control everything, and they want to limit cash. In China, India, Argentina, Lebanon, Malaysia, Malta, Zimbabwe, Australia, they've all limited the amount of cash you're allowed to have so they can surveil everything. We've seen these countries have now weaponized money. And what does that mean, weaponized money? Well, of course, the U.S. does sanctions, but what they've even done is now they've made banks deputies of the government. Now the banks are like law enforcement for the government, right? So, oh, we don't like the country you visited. We don't like where you're sending your money. Oh, freeze your account, freeze your account, right? And it happens all the time. We've seen just recently the CFO of PayPal had their bank accounts closed for no reason at all. Um, a, a big company, a, a big pornography company, which you may not agree with it, and I'm not here to, to say whether it's right or wrong, but PayPal decided that they're not gonna work with them anymore. And now thousands, or I believe hundreds of thousands of workers that they have aren't able to get paid anymore because they're enforcing what? It's not even a law, it's not even illegal. They're not even breaking laws, but because they don't like it, they shut them off. So we're seeing uh, money get weapon weaponized. We're seeing massive distrust in all our institutions. So Facebook proved we can't trust them. They sold our data. Wells Fargo proved we can't trust the banks. They added all these accounts on. Experian, we can't trust them with our data. They got hacked and it got it to everybody. The Fed, we can't trust them because they're printing more money and making our money worthless, right? On and on and on, we, we're showing this massive distrust for institutions and Bitcoin fixes all this. Bitcoin fixes all this. And I know that's a big statement to make, but if you can point all your friends and family members to all these problems, which they're going to see, right? When you bring them to light, they're going to understand, okay, yeah, we have that. And you say that Bitcoin fixes this. So the price is not the only thing happening in crypto right now. It's not even the most important thing happening. So, you know, price cycles go up and down. Um, there's, there's market cycles. And regardless of what the underlying fundamentals say, the price is going to change. And I'm going to tell you why. But the thing is with Bitcoin is that it fixes this because we can have a hard, sound money supply. So with a fixed money supply, right, that can't be inflated, and then it's open, anybody can access it. It's borderless. No matter where you're in the world, you can access it. It's permissionless. Anybody can join in. You don't have to have permission. It's censorship resistant. It can't be seized, right? So the money can't be inflated. It can't be seized. Transactions can't be blocked or stopped. It fixes all those things, all those issues in all those countries. In, in Lebanon, they can't get access to their money. Well, if you have Bitcoin, you have your money. You don't have to have to get someone to do that. In uh, Like I said, with PayPal shutting down people's accounts, well, it can't be seized. It can't be blocked, right? It's permissionless. You don't have to get permission for it, all right? So we also have seen massive infrastructure build out. So Bitcoin, although the price is down from where it was, it's down from where it was even just a few weeks ago, we're seeing massive infrastructure build out. Um, just the other day, we saw $300 million transaction happen on the Bitcoin network. $300 million of, of, of value was transferred for only 32 cents. And no central administrator had to be in the middle of that, approve that or anything. 32 cents for a $300 million transaction. So the infrastructure is there. We're seeing massive, massive um, investment into infrastructure. Just in the last 60 days alone, we've seen two companies in the United States uh, raise money over $700 million to start doing Bitcoin mining. That's infrastructure. We've seen over half a dozen companies in the cryptocurrency space reach unicorn status. Unicorn status means over a billion dollars. That's not happening in the Silicon Valley. It's happening in the cryptocurrency space. We've seen the largest financial institutions in the United States get involved. I'm talking about the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, Ice Back got involved. We've seen TD Ameritrade. Uh, we've seen E-Trade. Uh, Fidelity, one of the largest financial institutions in the U.S. has gotten involved. They're doing mining. They're doing all these things. And so they're all getting in, in, involved. The infrastructure is getting built out. And then 
to, t- to back that up, we have this giant wealth transfer, maybe the largest wealth transfer happening right now where we have the baby boomer generation and all that money is going to be passed down to the millennial generation. And it's estimated that millennials will have more disposable income than any other generation. And they're also digitally native. That means they grew up in the digital age. They're used to having digital assets. They're used to keeping stuff digitally. And then in addition to that, they have massive distrust for banks. They were born, they grew up in this 2008, 2009 financial crash where the banks basically crashed the world financial system. And now they have this massive distrust for banks. In a recent poll, 71% of millennials said they would rather go to the dentist than listen to a banker. They don't trust them. So they don't trust us. So you have all these things. And so then when I ask you, why is the price going nowhere or down, right? Why is it going down when I tell you all these things are happening? And the reason why is because it takes time. It takes time, right? You need to be patient. You're expecting too much too soon. You have to understand that all technologies, all new technology cycles work the exact same way. So there's been five technological revolutions in the last 250 years. Back in the 1700s, we had the Industrial Revolution. We had the steam engines, the electricity, steelwork. We had automobiles, telecommunications, and now we're in the middle of one right now. And even though all those technologies are different, the way that these cycles work is always the same. It starts out with just like the inventors, the hobbyist tinkerers. Then you need to get some infrastructure so that it can start to grow and scale. Once you start getting the infrastructure, then you start getting the platforms that people can build off of. And then you start getting applications. So think about in the internet terms, right? So in the internet terms, back in the 60s and the 70s, you had the people actually inventing it and creating it. Fast forward now uh, from the 70s all the way to the 1990, the first public website went uh, went up. In the mid-90s, we got the first search engine that allowed av- average people to use it. So that was infrastructure. That's 25 years later. Then in the late 90s, we started getting platforms, right? Platforms like Amazon. And then we in the in the you know mid to late 2000s, we started getting applications, right? So we're talking 30 years here, right? All technolo- technology cycles work the same way. And we started with just the hobbyists and tinkerers. And now, as I just said, we're starting to get the the infrastructure being built out. So that's where we are in the cycle. You have to understand this. And that's a technology cycle. You have to understand that a money cycle takes way longer. For something to become a money takes a long time. It starts out with just being a collectible. It's it's rare, it's scarce, people like it, and they're willing to put money into it. It could be a baseball card, it could be a Pokemon card, it could be a certain artist paintings, it could be a, a, a limited production sports car, right? It's a collectible. And after enough people start putting their money into it, it becomes collectible, then it becomes a store of value. Now today, the super wealthy, the 1% store a lot of their wealth in collectibles, in art, in cars and things like that. So it becomes a store of value. Once it becomes a good store of value, then it can become a medium of exchange and eventually it can move on from medium exchange to a unit of account. And so today, Bitcoin is still in the collectible stage. It's all speculative. Everyone's betting that it's gonna go up in value. It has not reached the store of value stays. So people say, and your friends and family are going to tell you this week, this weekend or this, this these holiday seasons that it's not a good store of value. And I'd say, you're right. It's not. It's not today. It will be, but it's not today. And so we need to focus on the drivers, right? So answer this. Ask, ask your friends and family this. Will the governments become less oppressive in the future or more? Will they, will the governments all of a sudden wake up tomorrow and become fiscally responsible and decide to cut debt and live on a budget? Are the young people, are they going to become more trusting of the institutions or less? Will the young people leave digital to go back to the old analog, right? Those are the drivers. Just ask yourself, which one is going to happen? Which one is going to be true? And so you have to, there's a quote that I like. uh, It says, Bitcoin isn't a get rich quick scheme. It's a get free scheme quick scheme. It's a get poor slow scheme, right? It saves us from all those problems that are happening. It's not about getting rich overnight. It's not about buying today and and tomorrow or or in a month or two months doubling my money. It's not about that. It's about this long-term game and all those things are happening. So again, I say patience. Imagine, imagine if you saw a little boy and, uh, if you if you saw a little boy and you said, man, this little boy, he, there's no way he could play basketball. He's too young. He's too short. He couldn't score a point but it was like LeBron James when he was little, right? Just because he wasn't the best basketball player in the world at that time didn't mean that he wouldn't grow up to be that person, right? It takes time. So just because Bitcoin isn't what it's going to be today doesn't mean that it won't be one day. So when they ask you, how's Bitcoin going? Say, well, 
Let's look at the fundamentals. Will the governments become less oppressive? Will they start being fiscally responsible? Responsible, right? Uh, and, and all these things, like I just said, and put that into perspective. Tell them it takes patience. Tell them that it's right on track. The catalyst for pushing Bitcoin into adoption are all there, and we're also seeing the infrastructure build out at the same time. Ignore the price. And it's going to come. If you like this video, give me a thumbs up on it. If you don't like the video, give me a thumbs down. Let me know your opinion. I love to hear comments. I answer every single one of them. And that's it. Enjoy your holidays to your success. I'm out.